Καλησπέρα σε όλους. Σε ευχαριστούμε που είσαστε και σήμερα μαζί μας σε αυτή τη σύναξη. Good evening. Thank you all for being present at our meeting. With Archimandrite Peter from the monastery in England. He will speak to us about the prophetic character of Palm Sunday and about the mystery of the cross. This meeting will be translated in English, into English as well. Elder Peter will speak about the prophetic feast of Palm Sunday and the mystery of the cross. We do uh, offer uh, English interpretation today, so please choose the language from the English language from the interpretation option. Today we have only English interpretation. Πατήσετε το κουμπάκι Raise Hand και να έχετε ανοιχτή την κάμερά σας. Και δοκιμάστε το μικρόφωνο σας και την κάμερά σας. Με ακούτε? Good evening, your blessing. We thank you very much that you accepted our invitation to be today together with us at this meeting. I thank you very much and we do it with great joy because we love the effort you make in order to benefit so many souls. We can start. We can start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O heavenly King and Comforter, Spirit of Truth, which art in all places and fillest all things, treasure of goodness and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from all that defileth, and save us our souls, O thou who art good. Guide our steps to all the good thing and give the word of truth to our mouth. Good evening. I thank very I thank you very much for the invitation for me to speak today. The period that approaches is maybe the most blessed of the whole year. Every period has its own grace, but more especially Holy Week, which is the climax of Great Lent, has so much grace that the people of old would say that it was sufficient, the grace of Holy Week is sufficient to keep us during the whole year. It is a great privilege to feast and live again the most pure passions of the, of the Lord. Christ is our consolation. One of his names, one of the names of Christ is a, the Comforter, and he can console us because he has placed himself below every creature. Just like we cannot comfort someone if we do not place ourselves below him and humble ourselves before him, we cannot console anybody. In the same way, Christ is able to console, to be a God, a comforter God, because he placed himself before every below every creature. Now we have the privilege to focus, to concentrate and gather all our mind and attention in the person of Christ, who is led to the slaughter as a lamb. And if during the whole of Great Lent, the monks of old 
it was a period when the monks of old would ask for a new knowledge from God. This is more so even during the Holy Week and on Easter night. It is an opportunity for us to ask for new knowledge of his humility to the end. I will read the text and then there will be time for questions. The Lord is at hand, be, get, be careful for nothing. This is how the epistle reading starts on the Sunday, of, uh, on Palm Sunday. Through the epistle reading of Palm Sunday, the Immaculate Church announces that the time of our Lord's salvation has arrived that the time has come for the faithful to experience once more the incomprehensible mystery of divine economy. During these holy days, we no longer make petitions to God. We only offer a prayer of gratitude, which in its fervor turns into a fiery prayer of repentance. Besides, what more could man ask when he sees God crucified? Let all mortal flesh keep silence and stand with fear and hem trembling. Now is the time to fall down on our knees and worship with reverence the mystery of the love and passion of Christ, which begins with Palm Sunday, with his entrance into Jerusalem. It is the time to shut the doors of our senses so that we may concentrate our mind in our heart and approach with humility and reverence these eternal events. If the world drowns us in its many cares, then the whole of Great Lent and even more Holy Week is granted to us as an anchor of hope, an anchor in heaven, as it provides us with the opportunity and privilege to turn our minds from things corruptible to things incorruptible, from things earthly to things heavenly, and to immerse ourselves in the mystery of the way of Christ. Through her services, hymns and readings, the Holy Church reveals this mystery to us in an exquisite manner and strengthens us to discern the way of the Lord, each one according to his own strength. The way that Christ showed in a, is a way of extreme, extreme self-emptying, as the prophet foretold. In his humiliation, his judgment was lifted up. Christ revealed something unprecedented and incomprehensible to man, that evil should be overcome with God, with good, and this he accomplished by putting himself below all creatures. The maliciousness of the devil conspired with the wickedness of men who arrested and held in chains the Lord of the whole universe. Yet he was already bound by something stronger than iron fetters by his greater love. If in the Old Testament, If in the Old Testament love was strong as death, then through his coming on earth, Christ instituted the all-attracting might of his love to the end, which is stronger than death. The all-attracting, the almighty power of his love to the end is a love that is now stronger than death. The exhortation of the apostle, be careful for nothing, is clearly evident in the tradition followed by the church during these days. For example, the Lazar from Lazarus Saturday to Thomas Sunday, no memorial service are held for the departed. Also, in the service of Martins, we do not read from the Minion, the canons of the saints. The whole church is focused only on the person of Christ and the work of Christ's dispensation on earth on his cross and resurrection. Certainly, the epistle reading on Palm Sunday does not stop at the need to lay aside all earthly care. 
we must also refer to God our afflictions and the content of our heart with thanksgiving. Now is the time to offer God all those things that he deserves. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, as St. Paul says to the Ephesians. The Feast of Palm Sunday has a mystical and symbolic character. It foreshadows the great and notable day when the Lord will come again with glory. It is in this perspective that some aspects of the feast are to be interpreted, which would otherwise remain hidden mysteries, such as the fact that Christ accepts to be glorified by the multitudes as king, although he knew that in a few days his humiliation and the cross would follow. Consequently, the meaning of the Lord's triumphal reception in Jerusalem will come to light in its entirety when the prophesied event is accomplished. That is to say, at the second coming of Christ. We notice that in the Old Testament, the Word of God prophesies in detail the events of the life and works of Christ on earth. Thus, God's word precedes his works. Likewise, in the New Testament, many events of the Lord's life prophesy not only his kingdom come with power, that is, the church, but also his second coming. The days of the passions of the Lord Jesus must have been the darkest days mankind has ever lived. He himself said when he was arrested, this is your hour and the power of darkness. This was the hour of war against God. For us, however, this is the hour of the greatest revelation of divine love, the hour that resounds in our hearts with the words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thus, in a paradoxical way, although the days of the world-saving passion of Christ are the darkest in human history, they are at the same time a saving light that declares the perfection of God's love for man. The love revealed by Christ is the love that crucifies itself for man, who through sin had become the, the enemy of God. If we ask, it is a love that dies for its enemies. If we ask the question, who, cru who crucified the Lord finally? The answer is not so evident. Of course, he was crucified then, and he is being crucified again and again by our sins. But one could argue that, though we do contribute, we are yet not the ones who actually crucified him. Pilate was instrumental in the carrying out of the crucifixion, but we find out from the gospel that he himself did not want Christ to be crucified and declined responsibility for his condemnation. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. The chief priests, the, the scribes and the Pharisees prompted the crucifixion and contributed to it. Yet they could not crucify Christ themselves because their law forbade the death sentence. As it is said in St. John's Gospel, Judas, Judas betrayed him but repented and put a miserable end to his life. The soldiers hung Christ on the cross, blaspheming him. However, they did not know what they were doing, which is why the Lord himself prayed to the Father, Father, forgive them, for they not, know not what they do. The devil wanted but did not have the power to slay the blameless Lord, if God did not allow it. 
He has power, but no authority, as we see in the case of Job, where God told the evil spirit who wanted to destroy his faithful servant, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. Consequently, we see that in the case of the Lord, some did not know, some did not want, some were not allow, allowed to slay him. Who then put Christ to death? His crucifiers were indeed the wickedness and the sin of men, the malice and deceitfulness of the devil, but not only. It is the love of God itself that consented to be crucified. The providence of God allowed such circumstances so that Christ might continue in his sacrifice to the end. God the Father delivers his Son to be crucified. The Son willingly accepts to be crucified. Through the cross and resurrection, the Holy Spirit comes into the world and triumphs. We could say, therefore, that the Father is the crucifying love, the Lord Jesus is the crucified love, while the Holy Spirit is the triumphant love. We see then that the crucifixion of Christ occurred out of the infinite love of God, which he hid in the wickedness of the fallen world and in death. The Lord took upon himself the death of man with the words, For their sakes I sanctify myself, and they, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Through sin and the fall, man separated himself from God, obstructing his way to divine love with a barrier which he was unable to break on his own. According to the fathers, God himself abolished this barrier with the righteousness of his judgment. As Saint Gregory Palamas observes, the righteousness of God always precedes his omnipotence. The pre-eternal, incomprehensible word of God was able, of course, to save man by a single movement without being in incarnate. Nevertheless, this was the most suitable way for our nature and weakness, as well as the most appropriate for the saving God because he has justice on his side. Indeed, man was justly forsaken by God, since he first forsook him and willingly ran towards the devil, the originator of evil, and trusted in him who deceitfully counsels that which is contrary to God. Therefore, man was rightfully delivered to the enemy, through the fear of the evil one and by a righteous concession of the good God, death was brought into the world. And by the exceeding wickedness of the ancient evil one, death doubled. For by the action of the enemy, not only physical death takes place, but eternal death follows as well. μόνο ο φυσικός θάνατος, αλλά ακολουθεί ο αιώνιος. Εφόσον... Since therefore man was justly delivered to the bondage of the enemy and became mortal, his return to freedom and life also had to be performed with righteousness. God wanted the devil to be defeated first by divine justice, which he is constantly fighting against and then by the power of his resurrection and future judgment. God therefore omitted that which he was able to do from the beginning in order to do first that which he had to accomplish. But how did this happen in practice? The second person of the Holy Trinity came to earth. He became man and united those things that were divided. Christ assumed human nature in a sinless way. His conception was of the Holy Ghost. It was not preceded by pleasure. As a consequence, his death was unjustified, for death is the offspring of sin, which we all inherit when we come into this world. 
Moreover, his death was unjust because his whole life on earth was sinless. According to the prophetic word, before he even knew evil, the child Christ had already opted with unfailing determination for good. The Lord fulfilled all righteousness, kept every commandment, and therefore the enemy had no hold on him. As Christ himself said, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. For this reason, through his death, the Lord abolished the power of death and its dominion over the human race. He used his holy and spotless flesh as a bait to hook the serpent, the originator of sin. This is an expression of St. Gregory Palamas. So the spotless flesh of Christ became a bait to hook the serpent, the originator of sin. He became a heavenly bait, the flesh of Christ became a heavenly bait that hell swallowed up in its belly and it became a source of divine life. The enemy clothed himself in the form of the serpent to deceive man, and now the word of God put on human nature to deceive the deceiver devil. He gave his holy blood as a ransom. On the cross he tore the handwriting of man's transgression and delivered him from the tyranny of the devil. He rendered innocent those who bury themselves with him in holy baptism. Henceforth, the cross becomes the point where the love of God and the love of man are perfectly united. According to Saint Sophroni, the cross is the place and time where our created existence is united with the uncreated divine existence. That is to say, that which the fathers say is that have you seen a man a man that carries his cross he walks towards his salvation because the cross is the point where man is united with god through the crucif through the crucifixion of the lord the word of the psalm is fulfilled mercy and truth are met together righteousness and peace have kissed each other Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The only time in the history of mankind that truth has sprung out of this earth that lieth in wickedness, in, forth, in falsehood and corruption, was when Christ was lifted up on the cross. This was the moment when divine righteousness appeared to the world, not the justice which judges and punishes, but the justice that judges evil and has mercy on man. Divine justice, divine righteousness is expressed with the words, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. That is why Saint Isaac the Syrian says, do not say that God is just, because what justice is when Christ died for us who are his enemies through sin? It is an exchange of lives which is unequal. Christ gives his sinless life for, sin, for sinful man. The blameless righteousness of God who freely imparts mercy to sinful man look down to earth and his wondrous peace was made manifest, which guards the mind and heart of man in Christ Jesus. This is why Prophet Zechariah says, it's a prophet, prophecy that we read on Palm Sunday, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold thy king cometh sitting on an ass's cold. He is not coming as a punisher, but as a redeemer. The cross of the Lord is a fearful judgment awe overwhelms us as our measure is very meager and we cannot accommodate the love of god which casteth out fear
St. Gregory Palamas comments in his homily on Holy Saturday that if Christ had not taken flesh and endured the passions while we were still ungodly, we should not have desisted from the pride. Now that we have been exalted without contributing anything, we stay humble and from humility comes salvation. In other words, if Christ had not endured incomprehensible sufferings while we were fallen and godless, we could, not, we could never have overcome the passion of pride. Yet seeing now Christ's suffering and being mocked by those for whom he died, we are driven to ever great depths of humility. And humility is the key which even at the 11th hour, a few days before Easter, can open our hearts so that the Lord can enter triumphantly therein. This humility is the key that opens to us the gate, the, the door to our heart for the bridegroom Christ to enter therein. Christ came into the universe to fulfill the will of the Heavenly Father for the salvation of the world. Lo, I come to do thy will, O my God. By his earthly cross, the Lord revealed to the world the great mystery of divine love. In St. John's Gospel, a few verses after the description of the Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, that is, as soon as Christ entered the place where he would be sacrificed, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. The grain was Christ himself, the seed of heaven into this earth that was now cursed because of disobedience and sin. The word of the gospel that if this the word that the grain had to die in order to bring forth much fruit was accomplished on the cross. What were the first fruits? First, the thief on the right hand, whose heart was transformed at the sight of the blameless Christ, suffering unjustly while praying for those who crucified him. The thief was a savage and ferocious man, and he probably had committed brutal crimes. Yet in an instant his soul underwent the good transformation. He reproached himself, saying, We indeed are punished justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. Self-reproach opened his mind, and he immediately began to theologize. He confessed that the man who hung beside him as a malefactor was the king of all, and announced prophetically that he would come again praying, Remember me, Lord, when thou comest into thy kingdom. How did this malefactor, who had never heard the teaching of Christ, know that after the cross Christ would come into the heavenly kingdom? How did he know that Christ would come again? How did he know that Christ had the power to receive his soul? It is clear that this knowledge was the work of God in his heart. Another fruit was the pagan centurion who saw Christ crying out as he gave up the ghost, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. 
such a sight converted the centurion who confessed, truly this man was the son of God. Also, frightened by the terrible events, the disciples had deserted the Lord and scattered, but then straightway gathered again around the empty tomb. Joseph, who had hitherto been afraid to confess his faith and reveal that he was a disciple of Christ, suddenly acquired such boldness as to present himself before Pilate and crave for the, body, for the dead body of this stranger, Christ. Surely the greatest fruit of the cross was the coming of the Holy Spirit, abundantly poured out on the face of the earth and established in the hearts of the faithful. Who would be able to number the fruits of the cross in the centuries that followed? The mystery of the cross and the fruits it bears have been at work unceasingly throughout the long centuries of Christianity and will remain at work until the end of the world. In fact, it is not excluded that, as the last days draw nigh, this mystery will act with even greater power. The persecutions will be greater, temptations will arise from every side, life will become harsher and harsher, and the enemies of the cross will be more vicious. However, the grace that pours forth from the cross will also superabound still and still. It is not by chance that the book of Revelation describes a scene that closely resembles the, fe the Feast of Palm Sunday. The evangelist John sees the souls of the righteous as an innumerable multitude from all the tribes of the earth gathered before the throne of the Lamb Christ, clothed in white robes, carrying palm branches in their hands, and crying out, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. While at the same time, terrified by the dreadful signs and calamities, the mighty of the earth and the wise of this world say to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. When John asked who were those arrayed in white robes and whence they came, the answer he received was, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Which great tribulations, which great tribulation could this be? The great tribulation consists of the struggle to keep the commandments of Christ in this fallen world. Those who constrain themselves to keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ inevitably undergo suffering in this life. These are they which follow the Lamb with whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb, as it is written in the book of Revelation. They walked the path of Christ, and they loved not their lives unto the end. In the Old Testament, kings were hailed with palm branches, it is also with palm branches that the faithful render glory and honor to Christ, the eternal King. The souls of the righteous washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb, because only by the blood of Christ can man make the garment of his soul white again. Even if there were men willing to offer themselves as a whole burnt offering to God, their sacrifice would not be pure because they would still be, bear the defilement of sin within them, whereas the sacrifice of Christ was perfect thanksgiving to God the Father because the Lord himself was sinless. Isaiah prophetically saw Christ as a wound that could not be bound. 
from the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores they have not been closed neither bound up neither mollified with ointment this is a prophecy which we will uh, read during holy week and in the royal hours on holy friday the Lord became for us a man of sorrows and a suffering servant. Every member of his holy body endured dishonor for our sakes. As we will sing on Holy Thursday, every member of his holy flesh endured dishonor for us. The head bore the, head bore the thorns the face, the buffeting. The hymns of the church during Holy Week describe that the body of the Lord, what the body of the Lord endured, but what human language could describe the heart of Christ, what human mind would dare to enter the innermost sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, and behold what was taking place in the blameless heart of the Lord during his passion and on the cross. Holy Scripture and hymns give us an opportunity to approach even a little the state of the Lord during his passions. In the Gospels, no detailed description is given, but the main events at the crucifixion are mentioned. The fact that the Lord thirsted, the words he spoke, how he delivered his spirit, the darkness and the terrible signs that followed. Yet in the 22nd Psalm of David, which is messianic and refers to the passion of Christ, we are given a glimpse of the state of his holy soul. I am a worm and no man. It is this moving psalm which I recommend you to read whole. Psalm 22nd, which says, I am a worm and no man. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. That is, my heart became like wax that melts in my chest. Christ bore the knowledge of God the Father within, and no one could take it away from him, even during his last passion. This is why he confessed to the disciples, indeed the hour is coming, yes has now come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone and yet i am not alone because the father is with me he knew that he was fulfilling the will of the father and yet his kenosis was perfect he reached the climax of self-emptying when hanging on the cross he cried out my god my god why hast thou forsaken me the abandonment of Christ was real and he endured it in our place. That is why the cross of no other earthly mortal can compare to his cross. Saint Sophroni states that the human mind is unable to grasp what Christ meant when he said it is accomplished, nor can it go beyond these words. However, from the lives of the saints, we know that God forsakenness often comes at times of extreme tension in keeping the commandments and this is why he who endures it lives it as a bitter cup and a true crucifixion christ ascended to the cross with the whole adam in his heart it is very telling that the last two events before the Passion, which the Lord took with him, as it were, as he was walking towards Gol Golgotha, were the resurrection of Lazarus and the conversion of the harlot who anointed his feet with myrrh, that is, man's physical death, which is a consequence of sin, and the spiritual death brought about by immoral life. It is again it is again with the whole Adam in his heart that the Lord descended into hell. With the whole Adam, he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. 
The, res the resurrection of Lazarus is a prophecy, pattern and symbol of the common resurrection on the last day, just as Christ's triumphal entrance into Jerusalem is a pattern of the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus. As Christ entered Jerusalem meek, humble, just and saving, so he enters our lives without observation without intimidating us or violating our freedom. Which of us, though, has a pure heart so that he may come to meet him with the sincerity of an innocent child, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord? If we examine our lives, we find that we have offered the Lord a bitter cup, a cup of disobedience, ingratitude, negligence, apostasy. However, even if this realization is true, we should not despair. We must always remember the example of the great Peter. His fall, when he denied the Master, was terrible, but he did not give in to despair. He went out and wept bitterly and he had never been closer to the Lord than after those bitter tears. Before, there was always something that separated him from the Master. When, for example, he said, although all shall be offended, yet will not I, this I rose, this I, this ego, rose as a barrier between him and Christ. Αυτό το εγώ υψώθηκε ως εμπόδιο ανάμεσα στον Χριστό και σε Αυτόν. Δεν αρκεί να κρατάμε... It is not enough for us to hold a palm branch in our hands and sing the hymns of the church. The way for us to become contemporaries of these eternal events is through our bitter tears, which will unite us with him who drank the bitter cup for our sake these bitter tears like Peter had. If we offer our bitter tears, then all our temptations and even our trials become for us opportunities to return to the current of the divine will, because in his goodness the Lord accepts our painful repentance and makes the mystery of the cross active in our lives. Our tears are thus turned into the raiment that will allow us to enter the bright chamber of Christ. We enter holy, that is why on Holy Monday, we sing, I see thy bright chamber and I do not have a raiment to enter therein. The, the raiment is provided through repentance. We enter Holy Week with a humble supplication that the bridegroom Christ may come and build his dwelling place in our hearts. And if our love for him is lacking and we are too ashamed to cry aloud the triumphant hymn, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh, we can at least say humbly, blessed art thou, O Lord, who hath come into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Forgive me these words. I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Father, because truly you made us go into the spirit of the great events that will come. I did not expect so many questions. Also, I would like to say to the people who attend this meeting that they can raise the, their hands to ask questions. I will ask some questions from Facebook. The first question, if we have not prepared as we should during all this time, do we still have time to to prepare and what can we do these last days before Easter? 
we have to cry to God with the voice of the thief, which we hear in the hymns. Thou hast vouchsafed the thief on the same day to go into paradise. Do thou grant to me the same. If you remember in the Synaxaria, in the lives of the saints, it is said, having lived few years, he died full of days. What is important is how we live our time if we fill our time with humble prayer. And we must remember that Christ has the power, like with the, with the good thief, to, to lead him into paradise on the same day. And he has the same, the same power to lead us to paradise. The Lord has the key of David. If he turns it on the right side, the gates of paradise are open to us. But God forbid, if he turns it on the right side, on the left hand side, if our life is not worthy, then we will be thrust into the abyss of perdition. Let us cry to him, you, Lord, have the power to enrich the poor and give life to the dead. Help us not to live in vain these days. Thank you. Another question, as a continuation to what you said, how to approach the Holy Week if we feel that we are not, that we are not uh, abiding with Christ during his temptations. But who is the one that remained with, together with Christ in his temptations? Even his closest ones, even his most beloved ones, forsook him. This is the tragic fate of all mankind, that which the apostles said, that even if we are not faithful, he, however, remains always faithful because he cannot deny himself. So the life of, of man is always unstable, but we have a constant that is unshakable in our life, and that is the person of the Lord. And even if we all forsake him, he remains faithful to us. And although we abandon him, he dies in our place. Although he did not sin, he took upon himself the wages of sin, the fruit of sin, which is death. Thus, even if we feel that we are betrayers, and it's good to feel betr a betrayer because this is the truth, then we shall confess to God in our prayer, God, I am fallen, I am a betrayer. I lie in evil and in evil deeds, but you are all, always the same. And I thank thee because you are always the same yesterday and today and unto all ages. Such a humble prayer, like a confession, as Saint Sophroni said, can become the beginning of a great prayer. We present to God our bad state, that we are in despondency, in spiritual indifference. Another question, why the church, why the church um, presents Joseph uh, from the Old Testament as an image of Christ. Yes, this week we read a very moving fragment from the Old Testament when Joseph discovered, revealed himself 
as the uh, I will say the story shortly because some might not know it this Joseph endured injustice and he endured it after, uh, he endured it from his own brethren they sold him to, to the Egyptians and he became a slave there but God turns, turned things in such a way that he did not perish in Egypt but became the master of Egypt and when he met again his brethren he forgave them everything and there is the brethren when he they went to to Egypt they did not recognize Joseph as being the young brother that they had sold and Joseph when he saw his brethren he hid himself because he could not contain his tears and the Hesychast fathers seeing this an image of the Hesychast life or an image of prayer that we should not show our tears but go in, 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 our, in a private place to pour out our pain to God and this is an image of what the Lord says that we should not appear unto men that we should not show our state spiritual state before others and so Joseph washed his faith face after crying and then returned to his brethren and said to them I am Joseph your brother and the brethren the brothers were afraid that he will um, punish them but Joseph said fear not I have not come to harm you but I have come to give you life and I will not harm you so indeed he's a an image of Christ in the Old Testament there are some persons that prophesied with words but other persons their own life was an image of Christ Mr. Manusos Heretis has a question. Good evening, Father Peter. From Crete. I haven't been to the monastery for 10 years. I hope to see you soon. I wish you good feasts. Another question. How does the Old Testament speak about the passions of, of uh, the Lord and how were they accomplished in the New Testament. The Holy Fathers speak about the mystery of Christ who is prefigured by the Old Testament. The, cross, the, the mystery of the cross, the energy of the cross, as the Apostle says that even now the Antichrist is already in the world. but he meant not that the antichrist lives and uh, lives already in the world but that his energy is active in the world in the same way we can say about the energy of the cross that it was always active in the world actually it is it has been active even since the pre-eternal council of god because the cross actually reveals this canotic love of the Holy Trinity 
where each person empties his own life in the other persons and lives the life of the beloved. But how can we know the Father only through Christ? So the Father poured out all his life in the Son, whereas the Son attributes everything to the name of his Father. And the cross was the commandment of the Heavenly Father that was given to his Son to come to earth and take upon himself death in the place of man. And this is active even from the Old Testament. The mystery of the cross is visible in the Old Testament in many cases. For example, Moses, when he spread his, his um, hands and his body had the shape of a cross, and through his prayer, he, the, the Jews defeated Amalek. When he lifted up um, snake on a stick, again in the form of the cross, the Jews were preserved from plague. There are many examples, such examples in the Old Testament, because the mystery of the cross was active, was at work from the beginning. Even in Eden, Adam was told not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this was the mystery of the cross for him. Because if he kept that commandment, he would have been lifted up to the level of the will, divine will of God. That's why the mystery of the cross, as St. Gregory Palamas says, is active since the beginning of the world and will remain active until the end of the world. Christian is he who bears his cross, not only who embraces the cross, but in his life is active the mystery of the cross. How? by keeping in his striving to keep the commandments of Christ. That's why a Christian can only live truly crucified, because only then he's truly free. As the fathers define freedom, true freedom is not to choose between A, B or C. This is not true freedom. True freedom is that which I choose, or to say better, when I choose Christ with such a determination that there is nothing that can shake me and influence me in my choice. Forgive me. Mr. Gavril has a question. Good evening. Oh, now I recognized you. We are in Cyprus now, permanently. And we have a child of nine months. Hopefully we will see you again. When will you come to Cyprus? When God knows, I only came once in my life to Cyprus. And, you know, we only come out of the monastery when God wants. Your blessing. Another question, another incident that we see in the scriptures on Palm Sunday is the parable of the fig tree. Can you tell us something about it? The fig tree without fruit, the fruitless. 
the fig without f- the fruitless fig tree is a theme that we meet in Holy Week. It symbolized is Israel because Christ shortly before his passion there was this incident where he found a fig tree outside Jerusalem and he went looking for a fruit to eat and he didn't find it and then he said this word no fruit shall ever come out of thee again and shortly after the disciples saw that the fig tree had withered completely now of course then it symbolized Israel but this is something that is valid for every Christian Christ asked from us to feed him can man feed Christ yes he can and this is how Saint Simeon the new theologian interprets the gospel of the last judgment because Christ says to them there to the ones that that were saved that I was thirsty and you gave me drink I was hungry and you gave me to eat if you remember the gospel of the Samaritan woman when she had that dialogue with Christ and although she was with an she she had an immoral life Christ lifted her up and make made her equal to the apostles she ran away and when the disciples came where Christ was he said they said to him Lord eat now and the Lord answered my food is something that you know not of and he meant that his food was the salvation of that woman that ran away changed transfigured so we must know that the food of Christ is our salvation the salvation of the whole world thus Christ comes to each one of us hungry and thirsty for our heart so that he can put in our heart his salvation the desire of thy house has consumed me says the scripture you see every word of the Christians of the scriptures is raises everything to the absolute measure so he was consumed the desire the thirst for for thy house and the house of God we are says the apostle the same thing happened with a fig tree for each man there is a time for him to be visited by the grace of God the time when man covers with his hand man as we see in scripture Lord said the Lord says Jerusalem Jerusalem if thou knew the time of thy visitation therefore when Christ when the Lord visits us we must not miss this time and the time that of the visitation of the Lord is now the present and the church shows us that now is the time of salvation so that we may always be watchful and to wake up from the lethargy of sin on Holy Thursday, we hear in the Troparion, receive the gift with fear and the fig tree. And all these images are presented to us by the church so that we turn to the Lord, come and say, come and save us freely, O Lord. Another question about the Holy Monday. What does it mean, the parable of the ten virgins, for us, the Christians of today? 
the parable of the ten virgins urges us to avoid the temptation of piety that is not to create our own religion and to have confidence in some virtues that we might have, that we think we have, and which anyway are not the goal, are not the purpose of our life. They cannot be sufficient in themselves. In the parable of the ten virgins, all the virgins had the virtue of virginity, which is a great virtue, but it's not a goal in itself, and it's not sufficient in itself. The ten were all virgins, but there were some that were wise and some that were foolish. So this gospel wants us to free us of the temptation that of which the Pharisees suffered because the Pharisees thought they had many virtues and they had put their confidence in them. But in fact, those virtues only helped them to increase their ego. But before Christ, are we righteous if we do not imitate his example? And even then, no man is righteous in front of Christ, in front of God. The only just and righteous is Christ who freely saves man and cleanses our soul from our, our defilements with his blood. The virgins that were wise were wise because they had enough oil in their oil lamps. And that oil lamp is the soul of man and the oil is the grace of God. And the life we have is a time for us to acquire this oil. The scriptures speak in another place about wisdom. The, of the, he speaks about of the wise steward. So wisdom is a great virtue. We must be wise in this life and acquire and store this grace of God so that when the bridegroom comes, we might be ready to say, yes, come Lord Jesus. The foolish virgins had no oil. And when the time came for the bridegroom to come, they went to find oil, but it was too late. And we must remember this always in our life. It is not by chance that St. John Chrysostom wrote on top of his bed, vanity of vanities. We must all remember that the time of this life passes quickly and surely there will come the time when we must give account for everything that God gave us. And then there will be no time for us to gather oil, to accumulate oil. That's why the parable of the ten virgins teaches us to redeem the time of our life and not leave our days to pass in vanity. The purpose of our life is to acquire this oil in the lamps of our souls. Forgive me. Another question, how can we overcome the temptations that become more and more intense towards the end of, of Lent and we become disappointed and even despair. However, we must not forget that we actually need these temptations. It's true that they become more intensified. You know why? Because during the Great Lent and especially in Holy Week, the whole church all the Christians as one body in unity, we make a greater effort, a more intense labor to take our 
a, a voluntary cross, which is actually our assist, ascetic labors, the prostrations, the confession, the prayer, attending the services and all that. And we bear a voluntary cross and we bear it with greater vigil vigilance in this time and seeing God that we show this disposition, he allows something that we have great need and that is the involuntary cross. If without the voluntary cross, we will not be able to bear the the involuntary cross. So without repentance, without prayer, without labors, when Christ, when God allows an involuntary cross in our life, we immediately get become disappointment, disappointed and we despair. Why does this happen? Because the, in, the involuntary cross is very important because it is, it is a cross that will heal something particular in us and God knows exactly that which we need to be healed. The involuntary cross trans turns our heart inside out as when we try to find something in our pockets and not finding it, we turn the pocket inside out. So the involuntary cross turns our heart inside out and everything that is in the deep heart, in its depths, is revealed. And this is what Christ does with us now, because God knows that he can give us even more grace through these trials. Of course, if we do not react in the same, in the right way, these involuntary temptations can can become um, a cause for a fall. It depends on how, how we react. The humble and wise Christian will receive involuntary trials by humbling himself and, he, and then he will attract the grace of God. As an elder said, when God gives us a cross, he does not punish us as his enemies, but he chastens us as his children. As a parent chastens his child because he loves him, in the same way, God gives us a cross, not because he wants to punish us, but because he recognizes us as his children. Forgive me. Mr. Apostolos Hadiyanis. Το μικρόφωνο σας ανοίξτε παρακαλώ. Ανοίχτω το. Ναι, τώρα σε μου. Γέροντες, ζητάω ταπεινά την ευχή σας. I humbly ask for your prayers. I would like to ask about of hypostatic prayer of, of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Saint Sophroni speaks often about this cup that Christ had to drink in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says that this is the person, the prayer of the true person. How can we have this prayer of the true person like unto Christ in Gethsemane? Because the cup that Christ drank in Gethsemane for us is impossible. How can we pray for the, for the whole world? And what is this cup for us? Maybe at least one drop of it we can drink. Thank you very much. It's a very good question about the cup of Christ, the cup of Christ is indescribable. It bears within 
all the blasphemy, all the sin, all the apostasy of man, which came, which was accompanied by death, and Christ took this death in the place of man as a new Adam. If we want to un understand the hypostatic prayer of Christ in Gethsemane, it helps us a lot to analyze, to study Saint Sophroni, the saint that you mentioned. Forgive me for my boldness, but I would dare to say that Saint Sophroni analyzes so he shows so deep knowledge of this prayer of Christ in Gethsemane because our saints, they had experience of this prayer. He, they knew how this prayer acts in man. When? When <clears throat> the grace of God overshadows the heart of man and enlarges it. The heart of man is its depth is immeasurable and God can deepen the heart of man so much that it can embrace heaven and earth and bring all the world before God in his prayer. In his prayer in Gethsemane, Saint Sophronis says that Christ presented before God all Adam from the first, from Adam, the first created, to the last man that will be born on earth. And he said, and he did that before sealing this prayer with his blood. This uh, hypostatic prayer is active in the saints in the measure in which they receive grace. And Saint Sophroni had this experience of such a grace through which man receives within the whole of mankind and brings all creation with big tears before God. In Christ's case, his sweat became as drops of blood which which shows the tension of his prayer. As for the saints, um, Saint Sophroni says that the saints pray for the world with big tears. That's the expression he uses, he and Saint Silwan. And this describes a prayer that is done unto the, until he loses all his strength, unto exhaustion. But this is not a human kind of prayer. Saint Silvan, for example, he prayed so much with big tears for all the departed, for example. Why don't we, the simple people, have such prayer for the departed? Because we don't have such an enlargement because we were not touched by the grace of God in the, in the same measure. Saint Silwan was praying for all the departed. But humanly speaking, a man cannot just put in his mind and pray with such big tears for all the departed. Saint Sophroni prayed with a hypostatic prayer for the whole of humankind and for many years, not once or twice. We approach this mystery with shame and fear, this mystery that is called the prayer of Christ, the hypostatic prayer of Christ in Gethsemane. Such is the prayer that, uh, especially of St. Basil the Great, the anaphora of the, same, of the liturgy of St. Basil the Great, is a prayer which is similar like the prayer of Christ in Gethsemane. This prayer covers all the needs of humankind and shows the sacrifice of Christ who died for the whole world. 
our saints penetrated in this mystery of the hypostatic prayer. And this mystery means the enlargement of man's heart, embracing heaven and earth, and bringing all creation before God in his prayer of intercession. Thank you very much, your blessing. Mr. Kyriakos Isichos. Your blessing. I would like to ask you how do you commend Christ's reception as a king and then he hears crucify him, crucify him. In order to have um, life in Christ, we must do the opposite. If we want to be glorified by Christ, we must be crucified for him. Yes, life in Christ is full of paradoxes. And one of these paradoxes is that look at the Feast of Palm Sunday. At the moment of the entrance, of his entrance to, the, to in Jerusalem, it is like we live a triumph. There was a multitude of people in Jerusalem at that point, and all these multitudes, they received Jesus triumphantly, repeating the words of the psalm. I think it is Psalm 118, when it says, Osana, blessed is he that cometh in the name in the world they actually, through these words, they accepted him, they received him as the Messiah, and they received him as the King of Israel, holding palms, branches of palms in their hands. And although we, we see these things, and we in the church leave these things again, and we say the same words, after a while, the multitudes disappear, the disciples are scattered, and the light of this feast vanishes. A deep night comes, deep darkness, a moonless night comes. Christ is arrested, he is condemned, slayed, crucified and buried as if it was a uh, mocking all this thing, like it was useless. And then one can ask this question, wonder what was the use of all this. But the meaning of this Palm Sunday is that it is a prophetic event. That's why we put the title of today's meeting, the prophetic character of Palm Sunday because uh, his entrance into Jerusalem is a prefiguration, a prophetic uh, pattern of the second coming of Christ. That's why everything happened in this way. Even this event in itself is a prophecy of the second coming of Christ. This is how it should be interpreted. Mrs. Angela Liras. Ξαναπατήστε το πάλι το κλείσετε παρακαλώ. Good evening, Father Peter. We are very glad to see you with Kiria Marika. I have a question. 
it is connected with the hypostatic prayer. We who are so sinful, how can we dare something like that? How can we even dare to pray at such a level? Although we are wounded very much by our apostasy and by that which we see at the cross in the Passion and the temptation that become more intense. In the Desert Fathers, there is a story about a monk who through his prayer, through his repentance, with his study of the scriptures, he assimilated the truth that the love of Christ is truly fearsome above the human measure. And he had this deep desire to become a bearer of this love. And he said, I will force myself to show love to all, because he knew that he didn't have such a love in, in him. And for 40 years, he compelled himself to show love unto all. And after 40 years, God gave him the grace of his great love. As Saint Sophroni says, there is an ascetic uh, humility and a charismatic uh, humility. There is also an ascetic love and a charismatic love. And the charismatic love is God himself. Love is his nature, his state. And of course, his love is much above our nature, our measure. This is the state that we must acquire. But I will tell you something. Even when we see very clearly that we do not have such a prayer as the prayer of Christ or the prayer of the saints for the whole world, we hear this prayer in the liturgy, in the prayers of the church. There is always this prayer for the whole world. Now, we must keep the prayer, at least for our family. Let us present them in front before God. But the distance that separates us, the distance between what we have, which is very little, and what Christ, Christ desires for us, we can annul this distance through our humility. The grace of God will show us this distance that we are very far from his love, but this benefits us a lot if we humble ourselves. In the Old Testament, the patriarch Jacob waited for Rachel, to be married to Rachel for 14 years, then we should do the same. We should love the love of God and be patient because no matter at what stage we are, this love will fill our hearts and will attract us to him. Let us show our small love and we will be given the great love of Christ. Thank you very much. We have another question. What was the cause of uh, Judas' betrayal, the 30 uh, coins of silver or something else? The cause was not the 30 coins of silver. The cause of the betrayal of Judas was the attitude of his heart. Judas did not have true obedience to Christ. He accepted in his heart thoughts against Christ 
uh, long before he betrayed him. This is, we know this happens to all of us. Our faithful, faithfulness and obedience exists there where there is love. When we love someone, we obey. When we love truly someone, we remain faithful. And this love is like the love of a mother. Even when we see mistakes in him whom, who makes mistakes, then we cover him. Even when we see mistakes in him whom we love, we will cover him, we will not judge him. So obedience is there where there is love. Judas, as Saint Sophroni explains, when he said, when he saw the sinful woman to anoint the feet of the Lord with that precious myrrh, and because Judas himself had the passion of covetousness, he liked uh, money. He was scandalized by the woman because, and what does it mean that he was scandalized? That he received thoughts, he accepted thoughts against Christ. At that time of the passion, uh, at the time of the passion, the disciples were tried by the, by the enemy greatly and when he saw this and when his the enemy saw in judas this temptation he didn't miss the opportunity to make him perish you see peter also denied his master but he did not allow thoughts to thoughts against his master in his heart even when christ called him Sa satan he didn't, he didn't simply tell him, go away from here. He called him Satan, Satan, because you do, not, uh, you do not think of the things of God, but the things of the earth. And Peter did not get upset. He did not, he did not abandon Christ, but he endured and remained with him. And we see that many times, most of the times, Christ did very paradoxical things that they could not even understand. That's why John said, when Christ said, when Christ said, break down this temple and I will uh, rebuild it in three days, John said that the disciples could not understand there. But when the Holy Spirit came, they understood that he was speaking about the temple of his body. So the disciples saw continually paradoxical things in the life of the Lord, but they remained faithful to the Lord. Whereas Judas, when he saw the, the sinful woman to spend all that money on the myrrh, this was the beginning of his fall. Κυρία Σαββοπούλου, ανοίξτε το μικρόφωνο και άλλη μια ερώτηση. Πάμε μόνοι. Σας ακούμε κύριε Σαββοπούλου, το μικρόφωνο σας. Μίσης Ελευθερία Σαββοπούλου. Δεν το έχετε ανοίξει το μικρόφωνο. Δεν πειράζει, προχωρούμε στην τελευταία ερώτηση. Γέροντα, The τι last είναι μαθήματα. What spiritual lessons can give us the attitude of Christ in his temptations and in his accomplishing the salvation of, the, of, the, of mankind? This is a great question. Christ for us is the measure of all things, both divine and human. The absolute criterion for our life is the person of Christ. In him we find the answer for all our problems, 
and in his person there are no questions that find no answer. In everything he did on earth, he spoke to us all the things that he knew from the Father. Everything that I heard from the Father, I made them known unto you, he said to the disciples. And he said that at a time when the disciples could not understand many things. And yet Christ said to them this word, whatever I heard from my Father, I gave unto you. So in his person, we find the answer to all our problems. In his temptations, we must remember in our lives that we have an anchor as an anchor of hope. This word that God did not leave his Holy One to taste of corruption. We must know that we are not orphans in this world. We are Christians and we have a God which is our Father and He cares for us. Even if death comes upon us, we surrender to His providence with faith because He is the one that cares for us. And as He did not leave His Holy One to see corruptions, in the same way God cares for us. God knows the ones that surrender to himself. Before we finish, tell us how to keep our, our hearts open to receive the grace of the resurrection. I think we must not wait, we must not expect anything for our heart to be open. Our mind must not be at the grace of the resurrection. We must be true before God. And in our prayer and in our presentation, we must be true. And everything else will be performed by the grace of God when and how God wants. So we only thank God for all things. for the life that he gave us. If the resurrection is the beginning of, your new, of a new life, let us thank God for this new life. Before thinking of the grace of resurrection, let us thank him for every ray of light that we saw in this life. And if we thank God for the little things, God will grant us his greater things. But this light of the resurrection is active in his church unceasingly. And the greatest, our greatest gratitude is that he brought us to his church, which is, which like, like a womb, gives birth to icons of Christ. And we see this last century, how many saints, new saints, the church has given birth to. Even in the three last years, we see the contemporary saints that were canonized by the church. Saint Evmenius. There are many saints in the last years, which we knew that they were saints, but the church made it official, canonized them in the calendar of the saints so that we do not forget that, that the church is the mother of the light-bearing ch children of God. Let us not be stingy and cheap with our gratitude before God. Let us uh, thank him even if we do not receive anything because he has given us all things. Let us close with a prayer. I I wish to all a great entrance into these holy days and let us ask God for a new knowledge. The, the Christian that knows, that
the love to the end of Christ is unshakable in his faith. And any temptation that falls on him, he will be unshakable on the way of God. <coughs> then we will know that we will not, that we are not orphans, that we have God as a father and that all his things are ours. Thank, to, thank you all who were present in the meeting with Father Peter. Happy Easter.